Tips and Tricks for Bonding Restorations. Please don't forget to follow us on our Instagram page and on our Facebook page. Just search us as Romero Dental Seminars. We want to thank our sponsors, Coteen and Oral Arts, for making this webinar possible and for providing our participants with one CE credit. If you want to obtain your CE credits, you have to visit our webpage at RomeroDentalSeminars.com. You're going to click on the webinars link and you're going to scroll down until you hit the CE quizzes link. Once you click that link, you will have access to the quiz that you need to download and complete. Then email to RomeroDentalSeminars at gmail.com to receive your credits. If you are an AGD member, we will submit the credits automatically. If you're an ADA member, we will email you a verification form for you to process the credits. And also don't forget to follow us in YouTube, or our YouTube channel, Romero Dental Seminars, and to subscribe to our channel. There's many, many videos there, webinars that are very useful for your daily dental practice. Our learning objectives for today, first we're going to understand the difference between etchable and non-etchable ceramics. We're going to identify the steps necessary to prepare glass ceramics for bonding. And we're going to identify the steps to prepare zirconia for bonding. So let's start with our tip and trick number one. We're going to talk about etchable ceramics. As you all know, there are two types of etchable ceramics that we commonly use in our clinical practice. Feldespathic porcelain, normally used to develop porcelain veneers, or lithium disilicate, also known in our practices as Emax, which is a brand name made by Vivo, Evo Clar Vivident. These two glass ceramics should be treated in one way or another fairly the same way. There will be some differences that I'm going to point out today for you to identify, but both of them need to go through a three-step process. Step number one, etching of the ceramic. Step number two, cleaning of the ceramic. And step number three, salinating the ceramic. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump to each and every one of these steps so that it makes it clinically applicable and understandable. So our step number one is our etching of our glass ceramics. Now I want to make some points here that are very important for you to know. It is not the same to etch feldespathic ceramic compared to etching lithium disilicate ceramics. When you think about these, feldespathic ceramics have a higher glass content than lithium disilicate. Obviously, because they have a more glassy surface, they're going to need to be etched longer. So normally, for us to etch feldespathic ceramic, we want to use a higher concentration hydrofluoric acid, like a 9.5% hydrofluoric acid concentration, and we want to etch our glass ceramics for 60 to 90 seconds. This again is your feldespathic ceramic, which is normally used to create highly aesthetic porcelain veneers. On the other hand, if you were to use more lithium disilicate in your practice, we want to use a lower concentration hydrofluoric acid, which is a 4% hydrofluoric acid, and we only want to etch that intaglio surface for 20 seconds. Now, you may be asking yourself, why are we talking about this first step? Because normally, you receive your glass ceramics etched by the lab. Well, the, my idea and my, the way that I like doing this in my practice is that I like to have control over this process. I don't want my lab to etch my glass ceramics for me. Why? Because they can definitely over etch or under etch. I don't, I'm not expecting, inspecting them. I'm not right beside them. I don't really know if they're doing it the right way or not. Do they know that there's a difference between feldespathic and lithium disilicate? Don't forget that the person in charge of uh, um, etching your ceramic most likely is not the main uh, lab person, the, the main ceramist, because the ceramist is going to be busy you know, stacking or pressing ceramic. You're, they're going to hand this off to somebody that probably has a lot less experience than they do. So because of that, I like to keep this under my office. 
I want to let my lab know that I do not want them to etch my ceramic. I want them to send either my feldespathic or lithium disilicate porcelain restorations with no etching. I don't want them to etch it. All I want them to do is to clean them for me. I'll get them back in my office and I'm going to have somebody in my office, whether myself or one of my dental assistants, to go ahead and etch these ceramics based out of a protocol that I'm going to create for them to follow. And this protocol is 9.5% for feldespathic ceramics, 60 to 90 seconds, or 4% hydrofluoric acid for 20 seconds on my lithium disilicate glass ceramics. Now the second step is to clean the restoration. And what am I cleaning the restoration if the lab already sent it to me clean? Well, when you etch your glass ceramics with hydrofluoric acid, you're going to get a precipitated metallic salt. That actually is viewed within the intaglio surface as a white residue. And how do you eliminate that precipitate, that white residue? Well, we recommend you eliminating that using a very simple uh, a technique, which is using hydro, I'm sorry, phosphoric acid for 60 seconds. Now that time does not change between feldespathic or lithium disilicate. Don't forget that high, the phosphoric acid really doesn't do anything more than just clean or eliminate this precipitated salt. And this is a question that I get all the time. You know, where do we get this from? Well, there's a lot of research out there published. Actually, Dr. Alex, Gary Alex in Inside Dentistry in 2000, 2008 published a very nice article where he reviewed all the steps for glass ceramic restorations. And one of the things that he did brought up in his article was the fact that this white residue is a problem. And it is, again, an insoluble metallic salt form as a precipitant after the hydrofluoric acid uh, uh, etching but the most important thing is that this definitely interferes with bonding and it can actually reduce your bond strength now sometimes I get people asking me well I thought that this white residue had to do with over etching and has nothing to do with over etching actually when you etch a, a, a glass ceramic regardless if you etch it for the right time or even if you over etch you're always going to get this precipitated salt the downside is that you cannot say, oh, I got a precipitated salt because I over etched. You're always going to get this. And because of that, again, this is the reason why I like to keep this within my practice. I want to make sure that I etched that glass ceramic so that I know that I'm using the right time. And if I use the right time, I know that I'm still going to get this white precipitated salt that I need to remove. How do I remove it? What do we recommend? 60 seconds, regardless of the substrate of phosphoric acid. Once you do the 60 seconds, we rinse we bone dry and we inspect before we go to the next step. Now, again, how do we remove it just to go over this? You go 30 to 40% phosphoric acid. What comes after the phosphoric acid? You want to rinse, you want to rinse and dry, bone dry, and you want to look at the integral surface. I'm actually going to show you some photos of what this should look like after the phosphoric acid etching. But most importantly, you're not done with the cleaning. I like to go a step further. I like to then place my little restoration in a plastic bag under distilled water or ethanol solution and I put it on the ultrasound for five minutes. This is going to give me a 100% complete intaglio, clean intaglio surface of my restoration. Now many of you may be asking yourself, so why do I want it so clean? Well, I want it so clean because as you will see in my clinical cases, I do, I try to perform very minimally or conservative type of restorations which require minimal preparation. And when you thought when you talk about today's type of restorations, you know either portion veneers or onlays or vonlays, whichever whichever name you want to give to these posterior restorations, these have no retentive. These preparations have no retentive features. They only rely on you bonding that glass ceramic to the enamel and the dentin left in that substrate. So if you're only going to rely on bonding, the question that I have for you is: Don't you want to rely on the best bonding possible? For your best bonding, you need to have a clean, both areas need to be clean. The tooth surface needs to be isolated and clean, and the intaglio surface of your restoration need to be well etched and clean as well before you go to the next step, which would be silenating and delivering your restoration. So here's a good example. This is what I wanted to share with you because this is what I see every single time after we etch in our office with hydrofluoric acid or lithium disilicate restorations. What you're seeing on the left hand side is a lithium disilicate onlay or vonlay or occlusal veneer, whichever name you want to give it, restoration for a premolar that I was going to deliver in my office. As you can see, 
after the hydrofluoric acid with 4% hydrofluoric acid for 20 seconds, there is a white residue. You can see that white, some white patches in some different areas of the restoration. You're not going to see it uniform. There are going to be patches here and there. That white residue, I should interpret as a precipitated salt is, that is a consequence of the actual hydrofluoric acid etching. So again, how do I remove that? I use phosphoric acid for one minute and that's what you see in the middle photo. I'm actually grabbing that restoration, holding it with my fingers and just applying that phosphoric acid in the intaglio surface. You don't have to have any special cares to do when you do this because phosphoric acid, as I said before, doesn't do any harm to your glass ceramic. It only cleans that intaglio surface or eliminates that precipitated salt that you want to eliminate because it will interfere with your bonding. On the right hand side, you're seeing the same photo of the same restoration. I'm sorry, a new photo of the same restoration. But now you can see how nice and clean and how frosted, uniform frosty layer of ceramic you have. That frostiness that you're seeing is actually what you achieve with your phosphoric acid etching. Just like if you would do on enamel, but you don't have the precipitate at all anymore. You can see that it's very nice and uniform and clean. So after this step, I'm going to bag it, I'm going to put it in distilled water or ethanol solution and I'm going to put it in my ultrasound just to get that extra cleaning, clean surface. Once you do that, you get it out of the ultrasound, you bone dry it and now we're going to surface condition which is going to be our third step. I like using, you can use uh, um, silane for this as for, as for any glass ceramic. But don't forget that silane is only good for glass ceramics. And in our office, we do glass ceramics, we do non-etchable ceramics like zirconia, or we do metals like gold, onlays or inlays. So because of that, I like having one product so that it doesn't create any confusion on the people that work for me. I want to have one bottle, one product that I can use across the border. And that is Monobond Plus. Monobond Plus made by Ivo Clarbivaden is a tri-functional monomer that will help you prime any of these surfaces. Glass ceramics, lithium disilicate, feldespathic porcelain, non-etchable ceramics like zirconia, and metal restorations like gold onlays. So that's the reason why I like this product. Now, how do we place this product? We 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 put uh, some on our, we, you know, we, we deliver one of these drops on a, on a little uh, carrying well. We put our micro brush in it. We have the micro brush absorb the Monobond Plus. And when you lay it on top of a very nice clean edge surface of glass ceramics, you will see that the ceramic will start, start to absorb like a sponge this, this uh, primer. So we only do one to two coats. You don't want to over primer restoration. And I always get this question. How do you know if you over primed, if you put too many layers or either a silane or a primer like the one that we're using Monobond Plus? Well, you end up having a shiny surface. You do not want to have a shiny surface as your final outcome. You want to make sure that you apply one to two coats of this solution. I normally apply just one coat because it's more than enough. As you can see on the left hand side, I'm putting that micro brush on top of the lithium disilicate, the integral surface of the lithium disilicate restoration. You can see that it's being absorbed by the restoration. That's what you're seeing on the middle photo. And on the right hand side, the solvent already evaporated the excess and now it's been absorbed in that glassy matrix this is what this is what's going to protect that edge surface this primer and at the same time is going to create that chemical bond with your layer of uh, resin cement that you're going to be applying in the integral surface before you deliver this restoration so what you see on the right hand side is what you should observe you can see that we can still tell that this uh, integral surface has been etched it's still a little bit frosty, but now it's been protected by that primed, uh, by that primer that we applied in the integral surface. So once we're done with that, with all these steps, I'm going to walk you through, and that would, that's going to be my tip and trick number two. I'm going to walk you through a clinical example so that it makes it more clinically applicable in your daily practice. So this is a case that came to my practice where you can see the mesial buccal cuffs completely fractured and the mesial marginal ridge as well. There was some secondary decay underneath the composite. So we removed the composite, we eliminated all the decay. And what you see on the right hand side is my final preparation with immediately, immediate dental sealing performed on that dentin. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of immediate dental sealing. We have a whole webinar on that. I also don't want to go into any details in, with my isolation, 
but as you can see I have complete control of my operative field we have a full webinar part one and part two on rubber dam isolation that I would highly recommend that you watch if you don't do this every day in your practice and you can actually have your your team members watch it as well so that they can help you perform these isolations before you even sit down in the chair and start working on your patients but we do we do uh, uh, recommend always rubber dam isolation so that we can acid edge prime and bond a clean surface of dentin and we can seal that dentin we actually apply a very thin coat of flowable filled flowable composite before we light cure and then we remove the rubber dam and we make our final impression and we send that that out to the lab the patient comes back in once we get the restoration from the lab again we control all these steps i like doing this in my office myself you don't have to do this your lab can do it for you all I would highly recommend is that you, you give your lab person the numbers that you're looking for. 20 seconds for your lithium disilicate, no more than 60 to 90 seconds for your uh, feldespathic porcelain. Once this ceramic is etched, look at the right hand photos again. You can see that white precipitate. It's there after you etch. I'm going to go ahead and apply my phosphoric acid, 35 to 40% concentration for one full minute. We rinse, we bone dry, and we evaluate. If you look at the photo on the far hand right side of the screen, you can see that we've eliminated some of that white precipitate. Now you can see a smooth and uniform frosty surface, which is what you should have before you go ahead and place your Monobond Plus. Your Monobond Plus is a primer. As you can see on the photo, we put a drop on those little wells, and then we just dip our micro brush within them we absorb some of the the monobon plus within our micro brush and all you have to do is just seat it on top of your uh, edge surface and you'll see that it will be absorbed it'll run it'll wet the entire surface and it will be absorbed by the ceramic one to two layers no more than that make sure that you never end up with a shiny surface you now let it sit for 60 seconds that will evaporate on its own it will be absorbed by the ceramic it will interact with the ceramic the way that it should and after those 60 seconds you're ready for the next step which is going to be delivery of your restoration so now patient comes back we isolate we clean our prep and we normally use uh, aluminum oxide to clean that preparation we get rid of any uh, existing temporary cement you under you you remember that i sealed this dentin so all i have to do now is just clean it and I can again I clean it with a uh, with my um, uh, aluminum oxide I rinse I dry I'm gonna selectively etch this is very deep dentin I don't want to etch this deep dentin and it's already sealed with it has a hyper layer on top so all I'm gonna do is selectively etch my enamel use a self etching two bottle or two step system the one that I use normally and I recommend is Optibon extra universal from Kerr which has a primer and an adhesive in two separate bottles and that's better because you have better control of every single step you have better control of eliminating the solvent in your, in your primer you have better control to applying a very thin layer of the adhesive you want two to three coats and then thin out that adhesive with your micro brush and then you can go ahead and light cure I recommend light curing your adhesive your, your, your layer hybrid layer prior to you seating your restoration and the reason why is because I'm using an adhesive system that I know has a very low film thickness and I want to make sure that that hybrid layer is completely cured I mix my dual cure cement apply it into the entire surface of the restoration wet the then the, the the two surface a little bit with the resin cement as well and then sit my restoration finally remove all the excess with a micro brush and like cure every single aspect of my restoration buccal occlusal and lingual at least for 20 seconds each to get a really good curing remove the rubber dam adjust anything I need to do with the occlusion and for that I always recommend using fine diamond burrs either football shape or or uh, tapered burrs whichever shape you like or prefer but they have to be fine diamond you just want to do very light touches you want to make sure that your lab uh, also did a good job you know adjusting that restoration for you so that you do very minimal adjustments the day of delivery but the most important thing is that once you do that those adjustments you want to make sure that you polish your highly polish your restoration I love using this these Comet polishing uh, wheels and points 
there there's a there's a two step polishing system one is blue the other one is gray you can use them for lithium disilicate you can use them for zirconia so they're used for any ceramic and any type of ceramic that you use in your practice but what i really love about them is that they give you a beautiful high shine high gloss restoration which is what you want because we all know that once the restoration is glazed and we remove the glaze that rough ceramic surface is gonna wear is gonna abrade the opposing dentition so you want to make sure that you prevent that from happening you have to achieve high gloss surface and this system is very easy very predictable and it gives you really good results and again you're seeing here now the final the, the restoration after the final delivery was completed you can see that the bio integration between the ceramic and the tooth structure is ideal but most importantly the high shine high gloss high polished surface that we were able to achieve after delivery also i want to point out the beautiful anatomy the staining that the lab person did for us in this restoration this restoration uh was done by oral art select department and again they do wonderful work uh, if you're looking for highly aesthetic restorations when i'm doing when i'm doing that type of high i want to achieve a highly aesthetic case i only use uh, i use oral art select department and i use and i also use mr perry uh, uh lab in uh Fitzgerald, georgia those are two labs that i can uh, mention today that i would 100 percent trust without any doubts this is oral arts the one that you're seeing here both the, the cases that i'm going to share with you today were done by oral arts but uh, Perry Dental Lab in First Gerald, Georgia is also a really good resource that you can use and reach out to any of these labs so that they can, if, if, you just, if you don't have a lab that you're working with or that you're happy with today. So my final tip and trick number three, my number three, I'm sorry, is to talk about non-etchable ceramics. So part one or tip and trick number one and two were all for etchable ceramics or glass ceramics. My tip and trick number three is gonna be dedicated to non-etchable ceramics, which in other words, it's our zirconia restorations. So the question is, well, why would I bond zirconia restorations? Why wouldn't I just cement zirconia restorations? And you know what? You're completely right. You can cement these restorations without any issues. But in order for you to cement these restorations, I want you to look at this at the right-hand side photo that I have here. You see those two perfect preparations that I was able to complete on tooth number eight and nine. They have good height, good resistance and retention form. That is what you need for any crown, uh, you know, any crown preparation in any tooth of, your, of the mouth. And if you have ideal preparations, well, why not cement if it's so simple and predictable? But the question is, when do I bond or do I need to bond? And the answer to that question is yes, because today we're doing, at least me, I'm practicing a very conservative type of dentistry in my office, which requires me to have minimal preparations. Onlays, vonlays, however you want to call them. Actually, veneers. I don't do any veneers with zirconia, but I've seen many clinical reports out there today with really good results using ceramic, you know, translucent zirconia for porcelain veneers. So if that were to be the case, if you were to do something like that in your office, the only option you have is bonding because these ceramics, these preparations don't have any retentive features. They're all, they're, they're made for bonded uh, 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 restorations so you're going to need to learn how to bond zirconia because there's going to be many clinical instances where you don't have any other options the other reason is that what happens if you're using more of the less str stronger uh, uh, zirconias like for instance the translucent zirconias that you would use for highly aesthetic cases and if you want to read more about this 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 topic this portion of my presentation it, it, to support this this portion of my presentation you can access this article called how to bond zirconia the apc concept published by marcus blatt really good paper everybody can download it from google directly just using that that title that i'm giving you right here in my presentation and I, and i would highly recommend that you read it because he's going to give you a lot of the scientific insight and uh, a lot of the, the the results of years of study two decades of studies on this topic that will make a big difference in your in the way that you see uh, bonded restorations in your practice today so again the 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 more translucent or aesthetic your zirconias are the, the less strong they are so you need to bond them to give them that added strength zirconia restorations that are thin like occlusal veneers or onlays 
or bondless, whichever name you want to give them. And circonial restorations that lack retention or they rely on bonding. Like, for instance, Marilyn Bridges. You're missing a lateral incisor on a young patient and you don't want to prep your essential and your canine. You only want to do lingual bonding or lingual, small lingual preparations to bond this circonia three unit type of restoration in their mouth. Well, you're going to have to bond. There's no other way that you can deliver that prosthesis. So you're going to have to bond circonia and you might as well know how to do it very, very well. So the APC concept is based out of three steps. A means air abrasion particle, P means primer, and C means resin cements or, or composite resin cements. But there's more than just these three steps because when we do it clinically, you have to first try it in. And I would highly, that's what I do. I would highly recommend that you try in first your restoration. Why? Because you know that you're going to get some contamination. You're probably going to get some saliva if you don't have good isolation or maybe there's a little bit of bleeding here and there, or maybe a little bit of plaque. So you're going to get that restoration contaminated, that intaglio surface. So I normally try it in first. Once I've tried it in and I'm happy with the fit and interproximal contacts, I remove the restoration from the patient's mouth, and then I start with my APC steps. So first, you can clean that intaglio surface using IvoClean. IvoClean is a very easy way to clean zirconia in a very predictable way. It is a little bit expensive, but it's a great product. So just, you know, one drop, you, you, you paint that pink little liquid inside your intaglio surface of your zirconia crowns, leave it there for 20 seconds, rinse and dry, and you've just eliminated any phosphates, any glycoproteins that were left behind during the try-in phase so that you have a really nice and clean intaglio surface. Your second step is gonna be to sandblast. Again, we know today that sandblasting is very important and I'm going to mention a, a couple of points in, in my next slide. But you want to sandblast with aluminum oxide, 50 microns approximately, maybe 30 to 50, no more than 60 for 20 seconds. After I sandblast, I want to get rid of all any particles, any aluminum oxide particles left behind. So what I do is I put it again in my little baggie under distilled water and I put it on the ultrasound for five minutes. Again, I want to make sure that I have a nice and clean intaglio surface because I'm going to bond to this surface. I want to make sure that I get the best bond strength possible because my restorations are relying on the bond strength. And then finally, I'm going to use my zirconia primer, which in essence is going to be the same monobond plus that I already spoke about and I explained why I buy that in my office. Now, there are other products out there in the market, like for example, Z primer made by Bisco. Well, that's a primer specifically made for zirconia or for metal. You cannot use C primer for glass ceramics. For glass ceramics, Bisco makes their silane. So that's the reason why I like having just one bottle. No confusion. Monobon Plus, glass ceramics, zirconia, or metal restorations. So again, just to go into a little bit more of the sandblasting, what does it do for me? Well, I'm sharing with you here two studies. Two very nice studies where it was actually proved that by sandblasting your Gitra stabilized zirconia with 30 micron silica coated aluminum particles, that which is Rockatech, that really other studies have shown that either that specific brand or just regular aluminum oxide particles, they both work very well. And what they do is that they also strengthen your restoration. It improves the fatigue limits and survival probabilities of your restoration. So not only that you get a clean restoration, but you get a better restoration that can be stronger. And when does this become important? It becomes important when you're using your more translucent zirconias that are more aesthetics, but they're weaker than the regular opaque zirconia or stronger zirconias that, that don't have any good uh, light transmission properties. So we're, I'm using that a lot from canine to canine today, sometimes even from premolar to premolar for aesthetic reasons. So if I bond that restoration and I clean it well and I sandblast it well, not only am I going to get a good bonded restoration, but I'm actually increasing the, the, the strength of that restoration just by uh, actually um, sandblasting my restoration. And, I'm gonna, and again, there's studies that show that today and there's, they're, they're published and we know that this is a valid step to improve the longevity of our restorations. So the technique that we recommend, again, 30 to 50 micron particle size, sandblast pressure, you wanna use a low pressure, 2.5 to 2.8 bar, or 35 PSI, no more than that. 
you need to have a blast distance between half an inch to no more than one inch and a blast time of no more than 20 seconds. Those are the four recommendations that are out in the literature that actually let it, tells us that this will help keep our restoration strong and will improve the bonding capabilities of these zirconia restorations uh, from a clinical standpoint. The benefits of sandblasting, increasing bond strength, increased fatigue limits, and increase the surface energy. All great when you're gonna bond and when you're using more of these translucent zirconias or weaker zirconias. So absolutely, zirconia sandblasting prior cementation is definitely a must. The other thing that we wanna know is our third step or our C, APC, which is the resin cement. Now, what resin cement do I recommend when you're using zirconia restorations? If you're using the high strength zirconias, which are very opaque, well, for sure you want to use a self, a dual cure, self adhesive, it's an option, dual cure cement, uh, or a self cure cement. But if you're using more of the translucent zirconias, a dual cure cement will work well because we know today that light goes through these zirconias better than, when, you know, there's no light transmission through the stronger zirconias, but there is light transmission. I good light transmission through the more translucent zirconias. So you always want to use a dual cure resin cement. I say self adhesive. Again, if you have a good ideal preparation, it's a regular crown with a with a with a very conventional preparation with good resistance and retention form. Just go ahead and use a self adhesive lutein cement. Why? Because you don't need to go through all the steps of etching and priming and bonding because you already have all the retentive features that you need on your preparation. But that is not the case when you're doing the more conservative preparations. When there is no retentive features in your preparations like your vonlays or onlays, occlusal veneers or onlays, whichever name you want to give them, or even your zirconia veneers if you're, if, you're in, if you're doing that in your practice. These don't have any retentive features. So for this, you're going to need enamel and you're going to need to etch the enamel. And I would recommend to combine any dual cure resin cement with a system that requires etching phosphoric acid etching of the enamel and a two-step bottle system of a self-etching adhesive two-bottle step system like OptiBon Extra Universal. That is what I would recommend, you know, full-blown every single step for your non-retentive preparations and your self-adhesive looting cements for your very well and, you know, very good retentive preparations. So for, for my last case to share with you today in the morning, I want you to see this case. You can see that there were a lot of aesthetic concerns. Patient initially came because crown on tooth number nine had fallen out. The day that I saw her, I rebonded that. I knew that we were, she knew that we were going to remove it, but I needed, I didn't have time that day to start my treatment planning and I needed to get some impressions and some photos for me to plan this case because this was going to be a fairly large case and I wanted to plan it very, very well. Uh, so I took the photos. We decided to do clinical crown lengthening and this case was actually performed by my good friend, the periodontist, Dr. Roger Arcer. He is now a, a, a near the Houston area. He's an excellent periodontist, highly recommended. I used to work with him very closely for many, many years. So he did a lot of my cases for the last, I would say five to seven years. This is one of his cases. Normally what we did with Dr. Arce is that once he completed the surgery, he would send the patient back to me. Maybe 15 to 20 days later, I would reprep, put new temporaries on and then wait two to two and a half months for complete healing before I did my final prepare my final preparations and final impressions. This is my wax up that I developed, you know, after the clinical crown lengthening. And these are my temporaries that were placed 15 to 20 days after the surgery. Again, after the surgery, I don't do my final impression. I always wait two and a half months. The longer you wait, the better you are because you may get some a little bit of recession here and there and you want to make sure that you reprep those areas before your final impression. So don't rush in cases like this. For this particular patient, we obtain a PVS impression. You can see the day of impression and you can see how many teeth were involved in this rehabilitation. And we decided to go with the less or, or weaker zirconia, if you want to call it that way, the more translucent edic zirconia from first bicuspid to first bicuspid, and then on our second bicuspid and on our motor, just go with a regular, uh, 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 you know, stronger zirconia. Uh, this for aesthetic reasons. These are our dyes. 
mounted in our articulator, sent to the lab. The lab went ahead and fabricated uh, our restorations. You can see this photo was taken with the light right behind the ceramic restorations. You can see how much light is going through these more translucent zirconias. They're beautiful. They're very highly aesthetic, but they are weaker. So that's the reason why I only bond these restorations. I don't cement them. I bond them, and for me to bond them, I need to have, uh, you know, I need to have a technique. And you already know the technique. We've gone through all the steps. For this particular case, I decided to use solo sem, which is a self-adhesive resin cement. This does not require me to prep anything on her teeth. As you know, these teeth were prepped for crowns, conventional crowns, so they were very retentive. They had good retention and resistant form. Uh, so I just decided to do solo sem, which is a self-adhesive resin cement. Very easy to use. It comes in a couple of shades, but for this, I just normally use my clear shade. I don't want to modify anything that I was able to obtain with the lab. And as you can see, this is probably maybe 30 to 60 days after these restorations were delivered. Beautiful ceramics, beautiful aesthetics. These were again done by Oral Art Select. You can see all the translucency effects that they were able to accomplish, all the incisor ledges, the way that the natural appearance of these restorations and that's what we're all looking for patient was very very happy but this beauty this photo right here really speaks volumes of the quality of work that they are able to deliver at oral arts select department you can see the texture the natural texture the developmental grooves that they were able to give these restorations on these side photos so i was very happy very pleased with the result with the aesthetic result from a restoration standpoint and obviously from the clinical standpoint as well because we followed the steps that we know we need to follow to make this work properly and at the same time our patient was happy with the end result as well so this is my final slide i want to thank everybody for being here today in the morning